Thanks, Selena. And welcome, as Selena said, to the last in the series. Well, Pompeii, seen there above you in about 1900, um, has been excavated since about the mid-1700s. Um, admittedly, the first excavations really focused on looting or treasure hunting um, rather than serious excavation. But by now, of course, Pompeii witnesses many multidisciplinary research teams, research programs. The emphasis for the longest time has been on peeling back the layers of ash and lapilli to reveal the town as it was when Vesuvius erupted, to get a sense of, of landscape, of, of, of building relationships to each other. And that continues, I think, still to be a passionate interest with a lot of the people who, have, who still work there. Today, of course, with over... Two and a half million visitors a year. This is not bad for a town that at its heyday probably had 20,000 occupants. Um, the really pressing concern is conservation of those places that have been excavated um, and trying to preserve what is there as well as reinterpret it and re-excavate and reanalyze it and make sure that it is lasts for the future. <laughs> oh dear. She, I'm, you know, I am an archaeologist. I'm really a, not so good on technology. <laughs> um, Pompeii research, once they'd revealed the landscape, once they'd revealed the sort of sense of town, Pompeii research is focused on, focused on four things. And the first of these that I'm looking at um, here is buildings. So having revealed the landscape, the focus has been on the structure of the buildings, the layouts of the buildings, the plans of the buildings, how the rooms relate to each other. Somehow in all of this, it often seems to me the people seem to disappear a trifle. As well as buildings, there's been a heavy emphasis on art. And this, I must tell you, is the only recollection I have of two years of Pompeii as a student at Sydney Uni. My dominant reflection, re recollection was there was a lot of red. And I should add to that, I have now painted my front fence red, hiding the graffiti. A, a, a tribute to Pompeii, of course. So the frescoes, the city, of course, is rightly famous for these frescoes, and they're immortalized, if not necessarily on the walls of Pompeii itself, um, in museum collections and in the enormous numbers of articles and books that have been published about these. There are quite a few still in situ, but, of course, a lot that aren't. Um, there's... The one um, playing here with this is on display currently in um, a dam Pompeii. It's a, a fine detail on one of the larger frescoes in the House of the Golden Bracelet. This particular one is on display, is still in situ in Pompeii itself, and the House of the Wetii, um, I think parts of it are uh, still in situ. They are beautiful because research is focused not just on the amazing beauty of these and their elegance and the figures, it's on the style of art. Uh, an early archaeologist identified four styles of art, um, first to fourth. I had, to this day don't remember the difference between them. Um, they focus on the subject matter from mythology to eroticism to links with the outside world such as the famous images of Nile animals and other Egyptian figures. Then we have, of course, abandoned objects. And one would think, as someone interested in material culture, that this would be my blinding passion. But I think perhaps I've developed a little as an archaeologist. I've gone beyond only thinking about stuff. And believe me, there is an enormous amount of stuff in Pompeii and in museums. Some of this, all of these, are on display currently in the exhibition. So... Every field of interest is catered for in terms of the sorts of research people want to follow in relationship to material culture. Um, largely, it's often seen, I think, as an art history approach, but then also it's about the contents of, of objects, um, the material they're made of, how they're made, how they're traded. Only recently have people started to look at residues, for example, to determine functions of objects, uses of objects, um, rather than simply... Uh, identifying this on the basis of the shape and style. But all of these are taken as something which will give you an in-depth understanding of um, the lives of those people who use them. And don't get me wrong, I do think they're, they're really beautiful and I, I love looking at objects. The fourth field that has characteristically been the focus of research has been um, the victims of Vesuvius. Um, 
from an interest in recovery as an initial issue through to uh, counting the bodies, um, analysing them in terms of health and diet, um, and then inventing stories um, to explain the relationships of where some of those bodies were found. There's some famous examples of the woman, the body of the woman who was found with the gladiators. Uh, she was frequently interpreted as clearly this was somebody who had who was a mistress of one of the gladiators. Here was an upper, an upper class woman who, who had this illegal liaison. There is nothing about these bodies that actually says, hey, I'm an upper class woman who's having an illegal relationship, an illicit relationship. This is, this is fantasy. And I keep finding elements of these fantasies woven into our stories, into our interpretations of, of the life of Pompeii. Um, There were lovely stories of people frequently rediscovering the same bodies, repositioning them when famous visitors were coming so that the stories are more important. But today, some of the most exciting work, I think, with analysis of the the victims of Vesuvius has actually been from an Australian archaeologist in Sydney, Estelle Laser, who's worked extensively on really getting to grips with the the physical characteristics of the, the bodies themselves. How many dead are there in Pompeii? Like many things, the numbers about anything in Pompeii seem to me rubbery at best. So there are accounts of anywhere between 1,500 through to over 2,000 bodies. Most people round it off and say 2,000 bodies have been recovered from Pompeii. But it's a bit like how many people lived in Pompeii. The first thing I read said 30,000 people lived in Pompeii based on what? Turns out that was based on how many people could fit to a room. Um, So how many people could fit on the seats in the amphitheatre? 20,000. No, at least 20,000 people must have lived in Pompeii. Oh, but wait, a lot of people came into Pompeii from the outside world to visit the amphitheatre. So you see this being played out constantly. Um, Currently, the estimates of population who lived there before the volcano erupted were anywhere between 12 to 20,000. So the majority of them then did indeed escape the wrath of the uh, volcano. But what about the subject I'm most interested in tonight? Um, What about graffiti? As you can see, it's had pretty bad press for some considerable period of time. Um, Almost without fail, the assumption has been that the only people whose lives this will reflect are the lower classes. So, therefore, it's simply not worthwhile studying them. Uh, So that's why it's more important to focus on all the wonderful things that have been retrieved from Pompeii and not to look at the written record. This attitude has been incredibly hard to shift. I was quite shocked to see that Wallace, as recently as 2005, was duplicating that same image. You're not going to learn much because it's only the less educated members of society. Um, I think there's perhaps a lot more that people can learn. But I, I do admit that in this massive town with this massive conservation problem and an enormous amount of material that's already been excavated, perhaps the written word isn't quite so beautiful. Um, It's certainly not quite as accessible to the general public and to those of us who don't read or write Italian or whose Latin is extremely rusty, it's not necessarily easily accessible to a researcher either. Attitudes, I think, are slightly changing, but there's a a lot more, I think, that can be done. And I think the archaeology of graffiti is really underrealized in Pompeii, as perhaps elsewhere. So what's bundled together with this list of, list of things that people talk about as graffiti? Um, I mentioned that figures are rubbery. It's not just the, the population size that's fairly rubbery. This notion of how many inscriptions there are seems to me a bit elastic as well. It's either 11,000 wall inscriptions Um, 11,000 inscriptions. So that could mean it includes the tablets on the wax um, accounts from one of the commercial houses. Um, It could mean anything at all. Um, What I would, of course, really like is that secret volume that has every single inscription. Um, It has it it in Latin or whatever language it's originally written in, because some's in Greek, some's in Oscan. It has a translation in English. 
Um, it has an image of it. It has the size of the text, and it has the place where it was found and the context of other things it's rela- it relates to. This is the treasure trove that I secretly hope will one day emerge into the public. Um, perhaps not as a book. Perhaps it would be there as um, someone's amazing database or several doctorates later. Um, just doing the looking at the material in 20 houses took somebody um, several years of research. <coughs> mm, sure. So you can see the things that people, the way people have actually looked at language, looked at inscriptions, has been first about how it's produced. So are they dipinti, are they inscriptions, are they marks on pots, or are they just that graffiti which we'll dismiss out of hand. Um, And then it's, what's the content? Is it about gladiators? Are they slogans? Are they word plays, magic squares, poetry? Those are the two things. No one's really looked at any of the other features. All this is slowly changing. We'll run through the sorts of texts that you actually that you find. This is the classic dipinti, the things that almost you cannot go through one of the streets of Pompeii without finding. Um, they start with ads for advertisements for games, um, and don't underestimate the power of games. In um, I think I've just skipped one. I've lost it. <laughs> okay, I've lost the ad for the games. The, uh, there are an enormous number of advertisements for gladiatorial games. They were incredibly significant in ancient Pompeii. Um, there are at least, it recognizes there are at least 43 days of games. With these people achieved political power. They showed their lavishness. They showed their generosity to society. Um, they're always advertised with things like We'll give you awnings, we'll give you sprinkled perfumed water, we'll give you bears, bulls, athletes and a procession. And then, of course, we'll give you the gladiators as well. Um, and if you do this, then, you know, you will acknowledge that I have given a great contribution to the city. Um, so as well then as the ads for, ads for games, which look very much like this, they're just in different locations, there are 2,800 uh, posters, electoral posters, I seriously thought a couple of weeks ago I was going to find perhaps as many as that around Perth so that I could add these into a contemporary thing. I didn't find any before the event. I was seriously disturbed by this. These 2,800 electoral posters, this abundance of posters, which all pretty much say, vote for me or vote for so-and-so, he's a good man, um, allow us to identify 131 uh, political candidates in Pompeii. 90% 90% of them um, after the 62 AD earthquake. Here, you're asked to vote for Lucius Gaius Secundus. And I apologise now for my perhaps slightly eccentric um, Sydney University pronunciation of Latin, filtered through years of not doing Latin. Again, um, another very popular candidate who's represented by 83 uh, electoral uh, programmata. Gnaeus Helvius, Helvius, there we go, I nearly said Helvius, Sabinus. There are 14 variations on the theme of please vote for this man, most of them asking that he be considered for the office of Edal, the office he's running for, which is a junior magisterial office responsible, I think, for looking after the weights or various business things. Um, They're often followed by uh, the initials DRP um, there, which looks a bit like a DRI, um, by... Um, so and so asks the rock at the end is Rogata that asks that you vote for him. Porcellus asks that you vote for him. Um, the AED is the office he's running for. The DRP, worthy of public office, and down the bottom that um, he's worthy of public office again. Where is it? Here. Um, I beg you to elect him. So, and here's the distribution of the electoral uh, dipinti encouraging the election of Helwius Sabinus. I found this really interesting. It's the first time I've really seen any sort of spatial consideration of graffiti in Pompeii. Um, and it's, it takes the, the mapping of them at this very simple level. It doesn't really explore what the buildings are that they're on. Um, 
what the relationship might be between each of these buildings. Are they just located because these are the main flower affairs and this is where people will see them? The whole range of questions is, you know, you think of, oh, surely they should have thought of this. Maybe they could think about that. But at least it's a start. These are, this, is, this is, you know, proper archaeology. This is taking, taking script and doing something with it rather than just looking at the content. Um, so as well as um, the analysis, the listing of these, somebody else... Let's see if I can find the place now. Somebody else have, has analysed. It's a bit hard from this angle to work out where I am. Ooh. Somewhere in here, there's a small piazza. Piazzata, it was called. I think I've just missed it. Somebody, somewhere in the left-hand bottom side of, of Pompeii, there's a small piazza that somebody has also analysed, trying to work out... Um, why did this small space have such a cluster of, this tiny little space have such a cluster of graffiti? So nine electoral prograta, four painted notices and five graffiti. So 18 in all. Why are they all there? So then they looked at the buildings around it. One's a bar, a caperna, and there's also on the same inch further down at the bottom of the block is the lupana, the brothel. So these people who were loitering around, painting these signs, reading these signs, having their names mentioned in these signs, were seen to have been people who moved backwards and forwards between the public buildings that surrounded it. There's some famous work uh, where people have decided that it was worthwhile mapping what they called the moral geography of Pompeii. And they suggested that the way to do this was to identify where were the bars that sold food and wine, where were the places that allowed guests to stay overnight and also sold food and wine, where were the people, places that had... Um, uh, had guests and stables, and where could you just get wine? They didn't talk about whether they were mapping where they thought the prostitutes were or not. Um, but they thought from this they would be able to show that there was a definite, a definite sort of clustering of the, the lower life forms, if you like, of Pompeii. Of course, it didn't work. And if you followed this system, it would mean that some 50% of Pompeii itself would, be, would show up on the deviant side of the moral geography of this town. I thought, God, this would be an interesting exercise to play with around, around Northbridge. <laughs> but, um, of course, we say the museum is the hub, the cultural hub of Northbridge. You know, we'd be slanting it in the sort of very non-deviant side. So, you think I'm in fantasy land? <laughs> we'll move on now to some of the other types of talking surfaces. We have formal inscriptions, these very beautifully, beautifully carved, I hope you can see them here. There's a vast array of, of beautifully carved inscriptions, dedications, um, uh, discussions with the gods, effectively. These are um, both farther on either side of the uh, northern entrance to the amphitheatre. There are um, a testimony to... Uh, What's his name? Cuspius Panza, father and son, who have restored at their own expense the um, amphitheatre after it was damaged during the 62 earthquake. And of course, by about, um, I think by 65, they were allowed to have games again after they'd been banned um, due to the riot between the New Syrians and the Pompeians. This is the, I did, I did actually mean to say I was going to do, get away with doing the talk about graffiti that had absolutely nothing erotic and nothing might shock people's sensibilities, but even I couldn't quite manage to do it, so I'm sorry if I've shocked your sensibilities. Somebody said last week it was impossible to talk about graffiti if you left out everything that was, um, could, could be considered erotic. I did my very best. We are, after all, a family museum. So different sorts, of, um, different sorts of marks. A mason's mark in there. I think I've written makers, but it's a mason's mark for building. Um, a gravestone for the 28-year-old Aulus... Uh, I've forgotten his name. Aulus Weus Nymphus. And um, the, what the guide told my colleague was how to find a brothel. <laughs> um, if that were true, then the moral deviance... Uh, rate of Pompeii would be astronomical. Uh, these are, of course, symbols of prosperity and good fortune. Um, so, not quite. Though, for some, I suppose, finding a brothel could be a symbol of prosperity and good fortune. I hate to disagree with the guides of Pompeii. Um, other texts that we find quite commonly, and again, this one's represented in the exhibition itself, um, are the contents of jars. 
This one is an ad for the, basically an ad for the maker, um, as well as a sort of list of, of what the contents are. But I like it, the fact that the best quality fish sauce is dispensed by Phoebus Remby, Augustine Friedman. I thought it was important for you to see what, the, what goes into garum and to think that this is one of the significant, as well as having people write on walls, one of the significant events and actions in Pompeii is the production of garum or fish, paste, fish sauce. I thought it was also worthwhile telling you that it was not just a delicacy for eating, either as a dessert or anything else, but was said to be able to cure anything from a festering bite from a dog through to some other evil, nasty, um, nasty sore. And having looked at, the, looked at the, the recipe, I think possibly that's entirely justified. So one of my favourite little inscriptions, not on, not on a wall, of course, um, and perhaps really not graffiti, though it's scratched, it's incised, it depends how generous we are with our term, is this very beautiful gold bracelet. And oh, by the way, it's got an inscription, um, Dominus on Chile Sue, from a master to his slave. Um, of course, this bracelet, therefore, the inscription on this bracelet, therefore, says an enormous amount about um, the role of women in Pompeii um, and about the rights of slaves and perhaps their relationships with their owners. Well, this is what real Pompeian graffiti looks like. Um, you see my, why, in my naivety, I hadn't quite expected to be daunted by this, but I looked and thought, I have no idea what this is. It could be a tag on my front wall. So graffiti is, is complex, but it's out there, and it's everywhere. Did I mention that people said Romans wrote on anything and with anything, but particularly they wrote on anything? Well, these examples demonstrate to you, if you read them, that by and large the graffiti really aren't particularly riveting as insights that will transform the world. Um, I thought this one, it took 640 paces to walk back and forth between here and there 10 times. I mean, that has got to be one of the most boring pieces of, of information about someone's life um, that we could, we, could, we could contemplate. So there we go. Um, perhaps, says, uh, perhaps August Mao and some of the others weren't so far off. So, can you all read? Does anyone need me to read, read through them or can you all see them? There's a lot like this. A lot of them also imply that there should be some sort of exchange um, between the writer, the first writer, the second writer, and the third writer, or between the people reading them. The, probably the most famous exchange is one that was, um, there are two people, Successus and Severus. Severus, um, Severus writes, Successus, a weaver, loves the innkeeper's slave girl named Iris, but she doesn't love him. Still, he begs her to have pity on him. His rival wrote this, goodbye. Uh, so then along comes successors who writes, envious one, why do you get in the way? Submit to a handsomer man and one who is being treated very wrongly and good looking. So, you know, and then the riposte, so whereas I have spoken, I have written all there is to say, you love Iris, but she does not love you. And so he didn't answer, he must have been heartbroken after that. So there's a lot of this interplay, it's a social act, it is a social act, the writing of graffiti, and some of you might see real parallels immediately uh, to what must come um, when we talk about contemporary graffiti. This is, I think, one of my famous, uh, my, one of my favourites too. Um, a famous example of graffiti that isn't entirely textual. From one of those dreadful deviant wine bars, um, meals, drink and lodging, there are actually four sections to this. Uh, I couldn't find um, a Frita, Frita Air, as it were, um, one that had the fourth one in it. So the first one has... Um, when I, the, in fact, the Museum Victoria label says, is this a prostitute? Um, the very learned article I read this morning said, no, this is in fact two women. Um, one of them is saying, I don't want to with Myrtalis. In fact, the question mark this time isn't because it was um, vulgar and I'm coy, it's because the word simply isn't there. Um, but they're thinking, since the women are kissing, that there's a, a close relationship that you know, might only be humorous to the people in the Carpona, in the bar. The second one um, is this lovely little exchange like, um, here, bring me a wine. No, no, it's mine. I want it. And the waitress, the wine, wine barmaid saying, oh, whoever wants it, take it. Um, and then the first translation I read said, 
go take a drink from the ocean. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, then I found this better one that says, um, Okeanos, come and drink. And an article I read this morning said, Okeanos is actually one of the famous graffiti, famous gladiators um, in Pompeii at this stage. So it's very unlikely that he would have been in the bar drinking. And perhaps it should be read as, hey, big boy, you come and get a drink. You come here. So she's sick of the two guys who are hassling her and she's sort of turned to someone else. Um, the third scene, um, the gamblers, has one, one black going, I won, the other one saying, no, no, it's not a three, it's a two. Now, the missing scene, of course, continues this. Here we have early graphic novel, Pompeii style. The missing scene has the innkeeper throwing the gamblers out, saying, because the first one says, you know, name, it was a three for me, I was the winner. Look here, blank, I'm not going to say this word, I was the winner. And the innkeeper saying, take it outside, guys, take it out, fight outside. So it's this lovely little sequence. And the idea is that this is meant to entertain. People are meant to find this humorous in the same way that a series of similar um, graphic novel cartoons in the, in the, um, in the baths, uh, baths that were originally thought to be um, a, a brothel, were also meant to entertain. Of course, I'm hedging my bets because I can't remember which baths it is. I do apologize. Uh, one of the most common, if not terribly exciting, um, graffiti from uh, from uh, Pompeii, one of watercraft. Often there are little plays on the images with um, names and all sorts of other things woven into the sails or into the water, into the texture, but no one quite understands why they're there, what they mean, apart from the fact that Pompeii was a significant... It, was, um, it, it relied on trade by water. It's near the coast. Um, until someone seriously interrogates the graffiti things like this and actually starts looking for context, we're always going to just have to dismiss them as, well, it's a, it's a watercraft, it's pretty cool, but yeah, okay. Now, these, of course, this graffiti have been looked at fairly extensively, and I'm sorry they're a bit blurry. Um, the two gladiators here, I think you might just be able to pick up there. If not, Trust me, they're there. There are another couple over here. But, um, I couldn't, I have no idea what it says and who they are. I think it's interesting that here we have one, Okeanos, um, a very famous gladiator, as you already know, uh, possibly um, a friend of a barmaid um, around the corner from the brothel. The, a large number of gladiatorial graffiti were found near public spaces such as the large theatre and the large palaestra which is the training ground as well as in the barracks where, where people lived um, the suggestion is that perhaps an enormous amount of the graffiti about gladiators was probably written by the gladiators themselves especially if you remember that one from earlier about um, what's his name the, the Thracian gladiator makes the girls moan they think it's very likely that he wrote it himself <laughs> And again, this one I included not because it's something that I have a translation for or I know where it comes from. It's one of those things. This is the problem. If you rely on Wikimedia Commons, you don't always get a context. <laughs> Bad for archaeology. But it's a nice photo. Um, beside it and down here, this is what this actually says. This is how it translates. And this is where it is. Outside the New Syrian gate, um, in the, in the uh, necropolis there. Um, again, it's, you know, you know, it's, it's this wonderful thing about someone's been magnificent by putting the games on. These are the battles they fought. With so-and-so was, was um, successful. <coughs> He's an Aronian gladi gladiator. They're the uh, gladiators who were trained in the Imperial Training School at Capua. So the chief is a stage name and Hilaros or Mary is a stage name as well. Um, they were successful. By this time, of course, gladiators no longer fought to the death as they did in all the movies we saw. Is Spartacus still running? Um, the, they, but it didn't mean, even though they officially didn't fight to the death, it didn't mean they may not come to a, a sticky and violent end. Um, there's a tombstone to a gladiator who was 38 when he died. Uh, that's a very old gladiator. Um, I mean, some of our cricket team would have long been dead if they'd been gladiators. Did I say that? I, we're not supposed to say political things as, as, as state employees. Well, what, 
about the real scratchings? They are bound. Apparently one in six graffiti is thought to be visual or figurative, but I defy you to find a treatise that will actually talk about these or explain them or really seriously discuss them. They're, little, they're dismissed as little trivial, trivial items. Again, another boat, God knows what, um, and... Um, this one's is actually a scene from an extended hunting scene with lots of little little images of, of animals. There's a lot of imagery in Pompeii that uh, relates to um, the exotic animals of particularly um, Egypt. Uh, um, so you have these wonderful painting scenes of Nile animals and hunts. And a lot of these animals are then brought back to Pompeii itself for, for athletes to fight. So I think the... the You've got sort of species dip, um, deletion, as it were, um, by the number of animals being hauled in for, for um, entertainment and violent end. Totally out of place. Let me just tell, show you an ad for, for a gladiator, for an ad for the games. Um, okay, it's not terribly exciting visually, and that should have been way back then when I got lost earlier. Outside Trebius, Trebius Valens, uh I find it perhaps the most interesting thing about this is how much has disappeared between 1920 and 2008 when Vanessa went there. So that's the original. That's what, what's there now. Okay, moving right along um, into the only analysis I'm aware of that really looks at both all types of graffiti from within a house situation is a recent publication by an American archaeologist, Rebe Rebecca Benethiel. Um, and I find it interesting that this only came out this year, so her results, she's only been working on this for the last four or five years. It's uh, astounding to me that no one's really looked at it holistically, that you can take the content as though it operates in some vacuum without looking at all the other stuff. And she's come with some quite interesting things. And it, so it gives you that sense of how does graffiti fit within, um, within a domestic context. It's not all about sort of stuff out there in the world for engagement. It's about engagement within the house as, as well. So you have, um, so here it's built over the western wall of the city, so it po it's post-dates the Roman settlement. So there's the looking into the back garden. There's looking into the peristyle. The idea about the graffiti, it's, it's placed either in the immediate entrance hall or around the peristyle so that anyone coming in, depending on which way the light's shining, shining in from the house, anyone will be able to see this. It's a form of engagement. It's a form of, um, it's like contemporary graffiti in, a, in an external situation. There's um, graffiti in response, graffiti in response. Um, number games, um, which I don't quite get. Um, so the, um, looking at it here, the seven... Um, uh, sorry, the, the XVII is 10 and 7, and beside that you get 7 Xs, so it's thought to be a sort of multiplying game in two different hands. So 10 times 7 gives you 70. I hope I put enough Xs in. Um, the other one is a bit of a play on sort of uh, sliding backwards and forwards. So 1X9, 11X8, then V117, V111. Um, <laughs> I've lost it. Um, V16. Uh, so it's. Um, I need a mathematical mind to be playing with this one. I sort of. I looked and thought, okay, I'm totally lost. But it's it's a fluid sort of shape of numbers moving backwards and forwards with different hands adding different ones to the to the sequence. And these there are lots of these um, around Pompeii. I'm not sure whether they're the people in the house or friends. <laughs> Um, but the sort of penis nose faces are sort of a famous um, Roman graffiti. Um, a lot of the graffiti in this house were also about a woman who apparently lived there. Romola lives here, it says. It also describes Romola doing a lot of other things, which I don't know that I'd want sort of stuck up on the wall of my house. She was a bit of a girl by the sound of it, a bit of a goer. Um, but Romola's got her tags around the house. One wonders if in a house where you've got the defiantly beautiful Venus, perhaps she was the, she was the sort of inspiration for this type of um, Romulan behavior. So I have moved amazingly rapidly from Pompeian tags into tags around the world in the historic context. So now we've moved to Egypt. Um, I haven't got any ancient Egyptian graffiti. I looked up the, the graffiti about Hatshepsut and her... 
steward sent in motion decided it made me blush. I didn't know about the ancient Pompeians. So I'm afraid, though, I can tell you it exists in ancient Egypt. You're not going to see it from me. So we do have tags, though. We have Belzoni over here, the strong man of Egypt, um, probably the original, one thinks of him as the original excavator. And we have the French liberally leaving their name um, on this 18th dynasty um, tomb as well. They're all, uh, this, this is in Thebes, Luxor, this is about 80 k south. <coughs> Sorry, I hope I didn't laser anybody then. Um, so uh, probably the most famous graffiti, probably in the historic graffiti in the English-speaking world would be um, young Lord Byron, um, passionately there, sort of defending the Greeks. Um, so here is his name, clearly rubbed a lot, clearly chalked, and here's the location on which he, um, up here at this beautiful temple, where he left his name um, around 1810. Bats in the New World as well, of course. So um, in El Moro in New Mexico, four centuries of, of historic graffiti. Um, it's quite staggering. And of course, we had to have one from Australia. So Darwin was here, though it doesn't quite say that. The Beagle was here. The Beagle was here um, in 1840, June the 10th. I, I see this is the quickest tour. I'm looking at the time. The quickest tour of graffiti you're ever likely to have, um, all with a lot of sort of salient truths. Well, tags, of course, have a certain universality, and um, not only my nearly painted fence, but my garbage bin is living proof of this. And contemporary graffiti is probably as complex as the dialogues and the variety um, in the Pompeian world. And I didn't think any look at contemporary graffiti could go without talking about Banksy, who's probably the most famous of the bad boys turned good, whose paintings now go for thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, the lovely story here is Melbourne, um, where they had some graffiti by Banksy uh, painted in 2003. Um, the first example someone who clearly didn't like Banksy because he did, in fact, overpaint somebody else in New York, thus um, raising the ire of a lot of graffiti artists. Um, somebody's come along and slopped... Um, this is protected by a big plastic sheet. Someone's come along and poured silver paint down behind the protection and then some wags written, Banksy was here. Um, um, but this little one, which is in another street, um, Melbourne council workers earlier this year were told to go and clean it up clean up the graffiti in this lane. <laughs> uh, no one, everyone thinking, of course they would know that this Banksy, you know, Melbourne was really proud of having one of these. Um, however, the council worker didn't know this and he cleaned up the Banksy as well. <laughs> so he says he's unapologetic. If somebody had told him it was important, he would, have, he would have saved it. I love this though. I love the rats. So little to say, so much time. Um, and the notion from where he started in Bristol with an incredibly large series of rat uh, graffiti, rat, rat stencils, um, the line that you're never more than 12 feet from a rat. This is such a three metres, four metres, this is a very disturbing notion, um, whether you think about it as a graffiti rat or whether you think about it as a real rat. Um, I think for him it's a rat as metaphor. Um, do we have internal graffiti? Yes, apparently we do have internal graffiti. Cooper Pedy is alive and flourishing in South Australia with um, internal graffiti. I will admit, of course, it is an oddity in the contemporary world <coughs> in, the, in Australia. But we also have some exciting historic graffiti. Um, I, I'd always thought, I remember this as being the America's Cup. I started to have this moment of anxiety that perhaps it wasn't, um, but I, just, I swear it was a telling story. Um, then, of course, we have this sort of collision of cultures, woggles and wandering wanderers. Um, so the woggle um, is... Oh, come back. The woggle is here um, liberating uh, a rock on, in northern... I think in the Pilbara, on the highway in the Pilbara, um, taking a southwest Aboriginal ancestral being... And in Perth itself, of course, we had this spate of, of wanderers that appeared. This created an enormous terore um, and discussions about power and display, um, ownership of, of 
of cultural property, the right to paint Wanjana's, um, the right to the need to show respect for cultural tradition. In the end, the senior Wanjana painter from the Kimberley said his greatest concern was that the person who was painting them down here might unleash the power of this spiritual being who's a creative being who creates not just the landscape but transforms it by bringing the rain, by encouraging things to, to fruit and to bear. It's a powerful act to bring it down here is a bit of a, a scary thing. I just wondered, are they still out there? So I'd invite anybody who sees Wanjana's to let me know. So more graffiti, um, this in East Perth. And this one... Um, leads to the same sort of discussions, I think, that characterise the analysis of, of Pompeian graffiti, um, those discussions between different styles. And here it's about those contemporary... One of the biggest contemporary issues, I think, is... Well, apart from the fact that it's illegal, which probably defines graffiti in the contemporary sense, uh, that notion of getting to hard, out-of-the-way places, that element of danger, that element of... Um, of bravery or bravado is one of the things that gives you kudos as a graffiti artist. And you get a sense of size by the person taking a photograph down here. Um, stunning, complex, overwritten. But of course you'll notice that they're really detailed and fanciful and um, the stuff you think of as more artistic than just a tag isn't overwritten. So there's a sense here of respect in the same way there was in the Pompeian house that none of those graffiti were overwritten and very little graffiti is overwritten around Pompeii itself. There's that sense of interplay and interaction, but not a sense of, yeah, get rid of it. Oh, my favourite place in Fremantle for contemporary graffiti. And I wondered, too, if this was a place that might lend itself to the sort of graffiti archaeology that's been so popular now in the States, where you can analyse the depths of graffiti, the layers of graffiti, take paint samples and see over how many years, what changes in paint, what changes in style... Um, but then, of course, one could perhaps go to the um, Fremantle Council and see if they had a record of this stretching back over 20 or 30 years as well. Um, the clean-up graffiti team probably have a very good record of, of what's out there. This has the full range of, of, tag, of graffiti, scratchies, tags. I had to ask about this, of course. Scratchies, tags, throw-ups, pieces, panels, legals, productions, everything that's possibly there in the suite of, of things that graffiti artists do is here in Fremantle. And Fremantle is interesting here, the wool stores, because it's got a quasi-legal sense to the placement of graffiti. Um, it's an abandoned building, and it's one where there's a sense that the work is condoned, um, but it's still... There are still wild tags, wild signs. They're still living on the edge and they're still subject to prosecution if they're caught. Again, there's that sense of get up there and, and take the photos. So you're, it's bravery, it's bravado, it's please don't let my kids do this. Um, and there's the, also the sense that you can overprint things that are outside of art. So um, I'm not sure whether you can see this. I had to put this in. It's the only political thing I have seen um, in the last month. And this I found after the election. So, oops, and done in chalk. But uh, ban the live animal exports, which is a, a serious, serious issue for a lot of Fremantle residents, um, is overpinned then with a whole range of other things. There's some really interesting layering here. And who gets to have, who gets to have the last voice? Um, <coughs> this is an example of when graffiti goes to court but ends, almost achieves heritage status but it's also a fairly tragic story for the guy whose house it is which is about a neighbourhood dispute it does bring to mind however a, a Pompeian graffiti oh walls you have held so, up so much tedious graffiti that I am amazed you have not already collapsed in ruins Um, with so many ways of messaging, um, we still do all sorts of... Uh, we engage in all sorts of forms of communication. I thought it's not quite graffiti, but it was one of the closest I could find. I thought it was really interesting to see this up here um, as a post-election as a post-election thing. So um, it's legal, it's, it's out there, it's, but it's, it follows those same formats and, and sense of, of communication. Well, WA, WA spends something like $25 million a year on graffiti. I don't know how that structure, whether it's employment, whether it's removal, whether it's programs to get rid of it, whether it all goes through Transperth, but that's an enormous amount. And WA also has some of the harshest legislation in the, year, in the world. 
um, well, in the Western world. The popular response to this legislation was wide-ranging and at times vitriolic, and I have to share this with you because some of it really I found pretty gobsmacking. These clowns are breaking the law. Lock them up. Now, I must say that this isn't graffiti I found. This was sort of blogging, which seemed to me to be a, almost like a conversation that might once have appeared on a wall. So after lock them up, I adore street urban art. It gives the streets feeling and expression. Teens who tag are antisocial. They smoke pot and join gangs. We need work gangs where it's compulsory for offenders to work. That dirty word, work, work, work. So... Tagging, the ugliest sight in our cities. This is not art. The punishment may be solitary confinement with a never-ending Mariah Carey CD or Billy Ray Cyrus. <laughs> if you nurture tagging, the first stage of graffiti, you will see street art, a vibrant landscape. Embrace rather than legislate. My, the final, and I think perhaps my favourite, you like graffiti. Are you perchance an academic majoring in philosophy? <laughs> well, if it's legal, and some um, companies, some groups have embraced that thing about let's nurture it, let's feed it, let's help people. Um, if it's legal, is it still graffiti or has it been suborned by the system? Have people lost out? I think we're incredibly schizophrenic about, gra schizophrenic about graffiti. I think we send amazing contradictory messages. Do any of you remember seeing the, the ads for have a say in your child's curriculum? And it starts off with groups of kids sitting in, in a bus and they're all drawing a sense of their future just with their fingers, but they're drawing a sense of their future on a bus window. I mean, this is such a contradictory message. You're, you're using this as an element of think about the future for one of the biggest forms and most expensive forms of graffiti in, in Western society, that scrawling, scratching on, on bus windows. I mean, we, we approach this so schizophrenically. So in the same way, um, something like here is taking graffiti, taking a contemporary graffiti imagery and using it for a local church, using it. So we take it and reproduce it in a legal fashion. Um, Trans Perth have used... Um, employed graffiti artists to do an enormous amount of, um, of work that is clearly developed from, um, from the graffiti itself. And a lot of these people have probably been um, living on the wild side. I, I just think there's this strange, strange sort of conflicting balance between our views of what graffiti is and how we, how we approach it. Well, here's the future of graffiti, projector bombing. I think our own little lava display, which you can see when the lights go down outside the front steps of the museum, might almost be considered a form of um, graffiti bombing, projector bombing. I think this stuff's wonderful, but as an archaeologist, given that it leaves no tangible record, I find myself a little disturbed. Um, I think it's interesting. I would have loved to have one to sort of, you know, tag all over the wall, but it doesn't, it doesn't give us anything it doesn't give us anything to sort of fall back on, though it allows people that freedom to, to express. Well, the last road, of course, has to go back to the Romans. And this is what they scribbled with. I think my message is these analyses are incredibly exciting, they're incredibly worthwhile doing, but, and if you start from the minutia, you start from the little things, you can lead out into a much bigger story and a greater understanding about the lives of both Pompeians and ourselves. Thank you.